Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in what I think is one of the most interesting areas of numismatics to our educational forum that, uh, on, to me, one of the most fascinating areas of numismatics, uh, what we call odd and curious or primitive money. Um, this is uh, something that I've collected for years, but uh, I always am learning something and to help us in that area, uh, we have joining us two of the leading experts in this field, Robert Leonard and Chuck Opitz himself, who wrote the book on primitive money. We're starting out uh, with you, Bob, because, you know, you just wrote a book not that long ago called Curious Currency. And how do we define this curious currency or what we call primitive traditional money. What is money? Well, Don, there's many definitions of money. When I was working up the introduction, I found many different things, but uh, I concluded that the best definition is anything used to make a payment that the recipient trusts, trust is important, can be reused to make another payment. In other words, if I, if I go to your table and I want to buy something and I give you uh, money out of my wallet, you trust that's American currency, that you can spend that someplace else. Um, in the past, the value of money was based on precious metals, gold and silver. People trusted in gold, they trusted in silver. Now we have paper money. And this is the basis of what money is. So in any other society, if there's something that you trust, whether it be a large stone ring with a hole in the middle or a feather coil 30 feet long or a, a shell ring or a string of beads, if you trust that if you take that, you can turn around and spend it and buy something else, it's money. I, I get it. The trust is, is an important factor, but, you know, we trust the faith of our government here and, and accepting this fiat money. What was the basis of the trust on some of these, uh, in these, some of these societies? Um, it wasn't just really trusting the government or whatever, because uh, sometimes I guess there weren't governments. What, what was the basis of trust for some of these types of items? Well, the whole idea of tra traditional money or maybe primitive money or proto money is that it's not issued by a government, generally speaking. It's the local tradition is what gives value to these things. Now, if we go way back to the Stone Age, uh, the Neolithic period thousands of years ago, uh, 2000, 4000 BC, we find that flint, which was valuable for making stone axes, became a form of money. Livestock, pigs, uh, cattle became a form of money because it was fungible. The axes were all roughly the same size. If you had a rough out and uh, you could spend that, someone would take it. A cow is a cow, so they were spendable. So fungibles, uh, items, items that can be exchanged easily, uh, important. But what about something like uh, implements, like uh, knives and hoes and serve? Why, why are those considered money? Well, beside after you, once you get past the foodstuffs themselves, like the uh, livestock and grain, rice, and so on, corn, uh, by measured uh, quantity. Then you need to get into the tools uh, and implements that are required to make it in the first place, hose. Hose are um, used as money, and in fact, in Africa, we see uh, special hose uh, made for uh, just for monetary purposes, ceremonial really. They're too big to be of much value as an actual hoe. And the same thing with weapons. We find weapons which of course are useful in defense um, 
that uh, throwing knives and so on, which uh, because they are useful become um, a form of money. Uh. And even again, we find uh, knives and so on that are really uh, just symbols of uh, a weapon are not actually useful as a weapon themselves. Ah, so they represent money, they're symbols, or it could be something of value like, uh, um, uh, like, like agricultural products or, or you know, in, in this, I wanna uh, bring uh, Chuck into this. I mean, um, in, in, uh, I've noticed in his collection uh, and I had the opportunity with my wife Candace to to view uh, to to be and see his museum full. Uh, there were a lot of different beads. Uh, Chuck, maybe you can tell us why um, why beads uh, would be considered what, and and why you had so many different kinds in, in your in your collecting uh, experience. Well, with beads. Uh, the African natives, which is where it started first, they wanted something because the traders from Europe wanted ivory, gold, things like that. And they had to have something to trade. They found out, they found beads fascinating. And each tribe tended to like its own kind of beads. And so the traders would take all kinds of beads to Africa to see which one that particular tribe liked. And they all didn't like the same one. And so you have a lot of different beads used by a lot of different tribes. Uh, the main bead, of course, is the chevron. And that was first introduced in the late 1500s. And many uh, tribes use chevrons. I also found that when I went to Indonesia, that chevrons had been used in Indonesia as money. There they were the seven layer chevrons, which were all made before 1600. And so that's why different beads were used um, over in uh, Nepal and Tibet. They use the Z bead, which is an extremely rare um, bead and very expensive. And they value that in those areas. When I went to Nepal, you saw them in the temples and they had tremendous value there. You take that same bead to Africa and it has no value. Well, that's fascinating. You know, uh, when you wrote your book, um, which is now the reference book in this field. Um, you, you call it an ethno, um, ethnographic study of traditional money. You know, when I was growing up uh, in, in this uh, field, um, we called it odd and curious money. Later, we called it traditional money. Now we call it primitive money. You called it Ethnographic. Why? Why did you use that term, and, and rather than saying "odd and curious" or "primitive"? And, and and why all these different terms for this money? Well, the way it started in the United States, we used and continue to use "odd and curious" money. In Europe, the collectors in Europe call it primitive money. And the reason they call it primitive money, they were primarily dealing with Africa, with their colonies, and these people were primitive. Australia and that area call it traditional money because they found that many of the people that were using the items were not primitive. Uh, when I was in the Solomon Islands, I flew in there and a taxi cab driver picked me up to take me to the hotel. And I asked him, you still use shell money? He turned around shocked and says, well, of course. I was gonna pay him in Solomon dollars. He's using a computer, he's driving a car. You certainly couldn't call him primitive. And what he said 
these were traditions and that even though they called it bride price, it really wasn't bride price as it was in Africa and many of the other areas. What they did is the man provided uh, shell money, corpus, tooth necklaces to, uh, in effect, you might say, buy the bride. The bride's family provided the food and everything that was at the ceremony. So it wasn't truly a purchase as we would think. And I said, why is that? Well, he said, in your country, to validate a marriage, you have a marriage certificate. He says, we don't have a city hall. We can go down and get a certificate. He said, but by bringing two, both families together, they validate this union as a marriage. Interesting. And so that's where the tradition comes from. And that's why in Australia, they never call it primitive money. Interesting. And I, when I was looking at these, I and uh, traditional is, um, let's say, easier on calling people. Most people don't want to be called primitive. <laughs> because in, in Africa, some of this stuff is still used. And the people certainly are not primitive. So some of these items, as you say, are still being used today, huh? Yes. And like uh, when I went to um, Indonesia, I went to Sumba and Timor. And there they buy, buy wives and they use the mamali in uh, Timor. And I had some for sale in the uh, auction there. And they were used to buy wives. When I was there, which was in 1996, our guide who had a four-year degree in English, and was taking us around, he was trying to get married and buy his wife. There it is actually a purchase. And he was trying to get a gold mamali to give to his wife's family before they could get married. And he explained there are many kinds of marriage there, hot marriages and cold marriages and in different kinds. And uh, each has a different cost. But right. there is a true purchase of a wife, where in the Solomons is more of a symbolic joining of the two families. So clearly you did a lot of traveling to, yes. to find these items. How, how did you actually get started uh, in this odd and curious field? Well, I started collecting coins in 1948 when I was eight years old. And U.S. coins got expensive, and I didn't have the money. The coin club I went to had two uh, very advanced odd and curious money collectors, and they would bring things down, trying to outdo each other at each meeting. And I found that for a few dollars, I could get extremely rare pieces. Uh, and you just didn't find these pieces. So I said, I'm going to try collecting that because I can't afford U.S. coins anymore. And then I got into it and I could go to the museum and find books. And um, then the problem wasn't to have the money. The problem was to find the pieces. And to this day, many of the rare pieces, the problem isn't the money. The problem is to find where the piece is. Yeah. Where in coins, that's not the case. You want an 1804 silver dollar. If you've got the money, you can get it in the next six months or a year. Well, there are other exceptions in that. It, it's oftentimes not not just um, uh, having the money, it's the opportunity. And, and you, as you pointed out, you, you were able to take advantage of many opportunities. So I, I remember uh, my father showing me cowrie shells that were oh, yes. used. And, and I think that's worldwide, these shells different kinds of shells were used um you, you know um and and besides the variety of shapes and sizes and and the history um it, it, it's just fun i mean chuck you you had the experience of going to so many different places can can you relate to us and share with us one or uh, <laughs> 
maybe in five minutes, <laughs> not, not too much more. But I, I know you've, you've shared with me a couple of your experiences. Share with the rest of us uh, one or two of your, your, your favorite experiences in finding some of this uh, money. My first, it was the first trip we took out of the United States, which was to Papua New Guinea. And we were there a whole month and we were with a tour and this was before they had independence. And these people were still using so much of the items that we call Ivan's money. They had the gold lip shells, they had the stone axes, they had the ax heads, uh, they had other kinds, cowrie shells, and various things like that. And I was able to purchase many of these pieces directly from the natives. And um, uh, my wife would go up to them and say, um, you know, like buy them, how much? And then they'd give her a price. And then I'd reach in my pocket, get out the money, give it to them and take a picture. And uh, so I really got a lot of things out of Papua New Guinea. One box I brought back was four and a half feet by four and a half feet by nine feet and weighed oh. 1100 pounds whoa sec yeah that's a big box that's a lot and i got more than that too but uh the second most interesting piece probably was yap island and you know i've collected yap stones since my wife gave me one as a wedding gift when we got married in 1964 and so I wanted to go there. Well, by 67, you could not export them anymore. But I wanted to go and see them. And so we had a private tour just for my wife and I, because other tourists weren't going to be interested in this. And they set up meetings with the high chiefs, with the queen of Palau. And we talked just about their money. Palau used beads, special beads, and uh, she had one bead that her family had paid $50,000 for in 1960. And if you saw it, you wouldn't give anybody a dollar for it. Well, I know that people all over, um, in, in other areas of numismatics, um, they know of the Yap Stones. I mean, that's clearly probably the most popular of all the primitive money, odd and curious money. Um, I, I, I don't know of any, anyone in the United, you mentioned that they don't allow you to export, they haven't since the 1960s, right? Yeah. To, to export now. Um, uh, and, and clearly it was difficult. They, they were excavated in, uh, in Palau, you say, and, and then brought over. Made in Palau. Well, made in Palau and then brought over to Yap and, yeah. and used as uh, what to trade for you know, bride or, or agriculture, right? So, so I understand that that's probably the most popular uh, item of, of, of this whole series worldwide, but what's your favorite? Um, well, I like the feather coil. Feather coil? Yes. Yeah, so yep. Santa Cruz, which- uh, Santa, uh, which, which Santa Cruz are you talking about? Solomon's. In the Solomon Islands. This is where much of your collection comes from, right? The Solomon Islands? Yes. Okay. When I was there, I met natives and I was able to buy stuff, things I had never heard of before. And so Kessa, I'd never heard of Kessa before. And I found a native woman there that we had some and she sold, I bought all she had. And um, so there's a lot of things like that that were used. And of course, the feather coil is almost as dramatic as the yak stone. And then there's a third piece that is extremely rare, which I have one in the auction. And it's a jacket that came from Taiwan. And this jacket, uh, I saw one in the Shanghai Numismatic Museum on display. But other than that, I've never seen another one. That was in and Shanghai, China, you say? In Sh yeah, Shanghai, China. Yeah. In their dismantled display. Oh, wow. 
And uh, they had described it and everything. I got some pictures of it. But this piece has 50,000 either shell or stone leaves attached to it. Tell us from a layman's point of view, uh, why is this such an important collection? Uh, what are the highlights to you? Well, this collection is very, very rich in New Guinea as uh, for obvious reasons. Chuck was there when the money was still current in many cases. And so he was able to buy it from the actual users of the money, the people who would be spending it. Uh, so it's a fabulous collection for Papua New Guinea and Irian Jaya, uh, now called Papua itself, uh, but also from the, the islands of the South Seas, which he also visited. Um, we've talked about the feather coil, but there are many items of stone and shell uh, that were, were used. So I would say it's richest in that area, and anybody has the least interest in obtaining items for a worldwide collection of I'm curious money, traditional money. Uh, this is an opportunity absolutely not to be missed. We, we don't have time to go into every series here. Of course, you've, you guys have highlighted some. I, I, you know, one of my favorite is the Chinese or Asian money trees. <laughs> Uh, proof that uh, money does grow on trees, um, uh, what I collected when I was young. Uh, we're we're going to uh, uh, wrap up uh, shortly. Uh, I, I wanted to once again show show the, the, the reference book. I mean, many of the items uh, in the reference book that Chuck wrote. Chuck, I want to uh, conclude with uh, asking you one qu uh, question. What lesson... A uh, major lesson, uh, probably several that we, we all get when we collect. What do you want us to take back uh, based on your experience uh, in collecting this? What lesson or, or, or what do you want to share with us to take with us? Well, the most important thing I think is that people are all different. All of these kinds of money were used by different cultures for different purposes, and none are the same. Uh, wife buying money, you go to India, there they don't buy the wives, the wives has to provide a dowry to the husband. And they all got logic for why they're doing this. And this is, each piece has a story. At the end of the day, it's a lot, it's about the story. And that's yeah. what, that's what we love the most in numismatics, the story. And thank you for sharing the story with us. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Chuck. We're going to wrap it up now. Uh, we'll see you, uh, see you all uh, at uh, 10 o'clock this morning, Friday morning, March 12th. And uh, uh, good luck to those of you who participate. And... Uh, uh, Thank you for sharing uh, your expertise and stories with us. Take care. Thank you all. Bye-bye.